Would you pray with me? Father, again, meet us in this place. Meet us in our homes or wherever we're gathered right now, whoever we're with. And Jesus, I pray that you would expand our vision of your kingdom. Lord, that that right now, in the midst of everything going on, that your kingdom would advance and that you would build your church. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. When I was a, a young youth pastor, just kind of beginning in my ministry career, I got my first opportunity to be called on to preach. Um, I I taught students regularly, I preached with them, but the pastor at the church I was at at the time asked me to prepare a message and deliver it to the adults uh, on a Sunday evening service. At the time, we still had Sunday evening services and And so I did, and I was excited, and I began to work and think, and I had been scheduled for a Sunday evening in early February. And I don't know when it occurred to me along the way that I had been assigned to preach on Sunday evening of Super Bowl Sunday. Um, And little did I know then uh, that that was preparing me for a moment like this with a big room, uh, but very few people. Um, But the reality is, is that we, we, there aren't very few people. In fact, one of the encouraging things that I've experienced over these last few weeks is how God has expanded the church. Um, I've had friends from Ecuador and other places who send me Facebook messages or an email saying, hey, I went went to church with you today. And we see that happening all over the place. And so if you're new with us, maybe you've stumbled across this, this Facebook link or YouTube link this morning. I want to welcome you here. We're in a series right now entitled Surprised by Hope. Pastor Jeff started this a couple weeks. It's leading us up to Easter where we've been looking at and talking about and thinking about the biblical understanding of hope. A hope that is is more than wishful thinking for a better future. There's a lot of that going on. But a hope that is, is a certainty a certainty that has been accomplished and and established, confirmed through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave. It's a certainty that that is our assurance as followers of Jesus. It's, It's what we count on and what we will celebrate next week as we gather for Easter, as we as we remember and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. But that that assurance, that certainty isn't only essential on Easter for the follower of Jesus, that that assurance, that certainty, that hope is what defines and empowers our everyday lives. We've been looking at this passage from 1 Peter. This is from 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter describes this hope for us. And when Pastor Jeff, if you remember, he's encouraged us to memorize these verses. Peter writes, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And his great mercy has given us new birth and a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. An inheritance that is kept in heaven for you. So last week, Pastor Brian talked about this promise of of heaven where, where Jesus in Revelation, we see him return to establish here a new heaven and a new earth where once again the, the people of God are dwelling in the world that he created as it should be. The way it was in its original design, unmarred by sin. And so the question that we've been asking ourselves and wrestling with is how do these promises, how do these words, how does this hope define the way that we live now? Or to put it in in a directive, this is the way Jeff worded it for us, is what we hope for shapes what we live for. I think all of us right now are are living in a general sense of waiting. We're waiting for when shelter in place is going to be lifted. We're waiting for the moment when we hear that we're cleared to get back together. I know all of us at Chapel Street are waiting for the day when we can gather together in person and see each other and greet each other. 
Most of us at home, in the midst of this waiting, we have burnt through every board game and every puzzle. We've watched every Netflix series that we care to watch. And so we find ourselves asking the question, what do we do now? In fact, we, my family had to get a little creative this week. Uh, my youngest daughter came up with, developed in her little brain, a live action version of the game of Clue. In fact, I brought a picture this morning. She required us to get dressed up, so our formal garb, and walk around the house and go to different rooms and look for clues in order to solve a gruesome murder. And we had a ton of fun coming up with this. And, and as we think about this, as living in the midst of this season, as a follower of Jesus, when we have this promise, this future promise of heaven that, that awaits for us, Sometimes in the here and the now, as we're looking forward to being with Jesus, we find ourselves asking the question, what now? What do we do now? Are, are we merely holding on? Is this, is this only a season of waiting? Not, not at all. At least not according to Jesus. Because in Jesus' view of things, it's this hope, it's the the security that has been accomplished in the resurrection of Jesus Christ that now empowers and and enables us to live a kingdom of God-oriented life. In fact, if if we were to sort of do a summary of the four gospels together, if we were to look throughout the teachings of Jesus, we would discover that the central message of Jesus, the thing that he taught on more than anything else, was on the kingdom of God. Or sometimes you would describe it as the kingdom of heaven. And and more so, what life looks like in the midst of that. And when people heard Jesus describe it, when they heard him talk about it, make no mistake, they were surprised by what they heard. And and so are we. And so today, what I want us to look at, the question I want us to wrestle is, what, what is it that's so surprising about this kingdom? And so surprising about this king for example, this is, this is in, in Luke chapter 17. It's a brief interaction that Luke records, but some Pharisees approach Jesus. This is Luke 17, verse 20. It says, once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say here it is or there it is because the kingdom of God is in your midst. See, the Pharisees are coming to Jesus and, and they're, they're questioning him because they've heard him talk an awful lot about the kingdom of God. They've heard him describe, they've heard him proclaim its arrival. And so they're saying, well, where is it? We don't see it. What, what is it that you're talking about? And, and Jesus says, his answer to them is, it's in your midst. You, you're, you're just missing it. And and so today what I want us to look at is what is so surprising about this kingdom that Jesus describes? And perhaps maybe ask ourselves the question, are there moments in our lives when we're missing it, when we're not seeing it? The first thing I want to look at today is the surprising nature of the kingdom. I want to look at the nature of the kingdom itself. And I want to flip over to the gospel of, of Matthew. This is Jesus has just come out of the wilderness. He's been tempted and he's just beginning his ministry here on earth. And this is where we pick up the story. Matthew 4, verse 12. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulon and Naphtali, to fulfill what, the, what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulon and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And look at this, verse 17. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This was this is describing the central message of Jesus, essentially him saying, stop. Look, pay attention, because the way that you have done life, the way that you have understood the world around you, the way that you've understood even what it means to follow God, it's changing. 
because I'm bringing in, I'm ushering in his kingdom here. Now that word repent literally means turn around and go a different direction. You remember those, ever had those moments in life when the way you've done something forever changes abruptly? And, and how that sort of upends you, how that catches you off guard? When I was in uh, summer between my eighth grade and freshman year, I had the opportunity to do uh, an extended mission trip in Bermuda. Lived in tents on this little remote island, but I remember arriving there. If you know, Bermuda is governed by the UK. And so uh, they drive on the opposite side of the road. And I had this moment when we were getting picked up in the airport and I was talking to my friends in the van and that sort of thing. And I, I turned and where my brain assumed a driver would be and what side of the road we would be on, I saw one of my adult leaders turned around and talking to the students and instantaneously, just as a reaction, I kind of had a, a panic attack. I gasped audibly because in my mind, we were heading for sure to a, a head-on collision because the operating system that I was used to had abruptly changed, right? It's like when they declared that Pluto was no longer a planet. It's like, how are we, what are we supposed to do with that, right? Everything that we've known all of a sudden is now supposed to be different. See, this is, this is what Jesus is describing here. Everything that is known, every, the way you've done life, it, it's changing. Now, to be clear here, the surprise in this isn't, isn't so much the arrival of the kingdom of God. The, the Jewish people, their entire lives through generations had waited for, they've expected the moment when God would reestablish his kingdom here on earth. In fact, there's a passage, the prophet Isaiah depicts this moment when there's a messenger coming over the mountains who's going to proclaim, he's going to deliver the news that the kingdom of God has been restored. This is from Isaiah 52, verse seven. He says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion or say to Jerusalem, your God reigns. So from the very moment that Isaiah had picked this, there's this expectation that a messenger would come, that he would announce once again the kingdom of God and the reign of God with his people. And what they did not anticipate, what, what, what they did not expect, what they found so surprising was the type of kingdom that God would bring. This is the reason that Jesus would spend so much of his time with his disciples, with his followers, teaching them and describing what his kingdom was like because he is reorienting them to a whole new way of doing life. In fact, if you look at this, from the moment when Jesus proclaims the arrival of the kingdom in Matthew 4, Matthew, in his uh, recording of the life of Christ, takes the next five chapters to essentially build an understanding of the kingdom. He does one of two things. He either is, records Jesus teaching on it, so Matthew 5, 6, and 7. This record what we know is the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is describing the kingdom to us. He's teaching us what it's like. He, he says, you have heard it said. This is how things were. This is how you used to operate. But now I tell you, this is what it's like in the kingdom. This is what it's like in the kingdom that that I'm ushering in. And then in Matthew 8 and 9, Matthew records story after story after story where where he is, Jesus is modeling to us what the kingdom of God is like. Because it takes so much time and effort to reorient us. First, he he shows us, right? He he tells us, he re-educates us. And and then he shows us, he models it to us. And if we think about this for a second, just even in the the way the Sermon on the Mount starts in Matthew chapter 5, when Jesus says things like, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. I don't have this on the screen today, but you'll be familiar with this, many of you. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers. Listen to this. Blessed are those who are persecuted. In verse 11, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. Now, if you've grown up in the church or you've been around for a while, we, our familiarity with these words can actually work against us. 
Because if we're honest with ourselves, our, our knee-jerk reaction to this, that is nobody's definition of blessing. That, that's not how any of us understand that or receive that. In fact, a little bit later in chapter 5, Jesus says this. He says, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, does that sound right? Does that even sound reasonable to you? How, how is it that that can be true or how does that work? There's only one way. There's only one way, and that if there is a whole new way of doing things, if, if there has been a radical shift that flips the value system that we've known and lived with entirely, our, our entire lives upside down. And this is, this is exactly what Jesus is declaring. This is the message that he's come to proclaim to the people. So the nature of this kingdom, and, and hear me on this, life in the kingdom of God is a radical reorientation of our lives around the priorities and value system of our God. Let me say that again. Life in the kingdom of God is the radical reorientation of every aspect of our lives around the priorities and the value system of our God. So if, if this doesn't surprise us, if this doesn't feel foreign to us, then in some ways we're not getting it. We're not understanding it. But this isn't the only surprise that we see in these verses. The second thing that, that emerges here in this interaction is the, the surprising nature of his subjects. The surprising nature of, of his subjects. When I was a kid growing up in rural Ohio, um, back behind our house, we had a garage back there and then there was an alley and on the other side was kind of a big open vacant lot. And so my brothers and I would go out with friends all the time to get games of wiffle ball or, or football or whatever, whatever we wanted to play. And on occasion, my older brother, who's four years older to me, than me, would get together with his friends and reluctantly, my, he would be, my mom would make him take me with him and my little brother. Um, and we would go out, we want to jump in this football game with, with my brothers. And I was obviously the smallest among them all. They're all older and stronger and more athletic and all these sorts of things. So in that moment when they're dividing up teams and the captains are picking, I was obviously always picked last. Um, and I knew that and I understood it, right? But on one occasion, I think like the, the Holy Spirit somehow overtook my brother's life. He was the captain, um, and with his very first pick, he picked me. Right? I was like, I looked around, I like looked at the other guys, like, and, and, and you could almost see the shock in their face as well. Because it's not at all what they would have imagined. It's not at all by anybody's measure or standard what made sense. Look at what Jesus does here. This is in, back in Matthew chapter 4. He's delivered this message in verse 17, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And now he continues in verse 18. He goes out from here. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. And they were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. And they were in a boat with their father Zebedee preparing their nets. Jesus called them and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Now there's, there's, there's two things here that I think catch me off guard when we're talking about the idea of kingdom. It, it's the how and the who. First off, again, if we can try to place ourselves in the mindset of a first century Jewish man, woman, or child who has spent most of their lives, well, actually their entire lives, in fact, for generations, they've lived under occupation. Most recently, the, the occupation of, of Rome, while simultaneously holding on to this truth, this promise that God would come to reestablish his kingdom among his people. They've waited for this. They've envisioned it. They've prayed for it. God's going to restore his kingdom and the people would once again be free. 
And when you've pictured this in your mind, your, the display, the, how you imagined all of this unfolding was going to be through this incredible demonstration of power, right? It's, it's, it's the strong exerting its will over the weak. It's God raising up the people. They're picturing something akin to, to how David conquered and established the people, King David. How the army overcame their enemies. They're picturing how, how kingdoms are set up and taken down. And people become subjects to this because they bend their will to the conqueror. But this isn't what Jesus does here. In fact, what we see is after Jesus makes this announcement of the arrival of the kingdom, he he takes a walk around the Sea of of Galilee. He sees people out doing their everyday lives, and he simply says to them, come come follow me. Come come be a part of what I'm doing. Come be a part of, of what I'm accomplishing. He doesn't, he invites them. He doesn't exert this this power over them. He doesn't merely just conquer them. He invites them to join him in his kingdom movement. And it's unlike any kingdom we've seen or known before. And I I want you today, I want you to hear the invitation of Jesus in these words. Because these words that Jesus spoke to the men, women, and children living around the Sea of Galilee some 2,000 years ago are the very same words that he speaks to us. Come, come. Follow me. Join me in my kingdom. Join me in my work. I want you to be a part of this. And perhaps you're feeling as if there's something about you that that doesn't measure up. Maybe you're feeling as if there's something in your life that has disqualified you. Look at who it is that Jesus invites here. These are fishermen. These are just guys out living their lives. They're, They're doing everything they can to support Their family. They're average, everyday, ordinary people. These aren't influencers. These aren't groups of people who have people following them that they can bring in under Jesus' authority. These aren't the the power brokers or the elite. These aren't the wealthy or the educated. It's just people. It's people who've heard the invitation of Jesus and in response leave everything behind in order to go and follow him, in order to go and be a part of his kingdom. And why would they do that? Why would they make that choice? And I think this is the third surprise of this kingdom that we see here. And that is the surprising nature of the king. The surprising nature of the king. I want to turn now, Matthew um, chapter 21, where Matthew is is kind of summing up um, his, his record of the story of Jesus and it's approaching his crucifixion. And this is a, a passage that we oftentimes read on Palm Sunday. Listen to this description. This is Matthew 21, verse six. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds went ahead of them and those that follow shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowd answers, this is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This, these verses record a, a well-known event in the life of Christ. In fact, we read these verses or, or this event in one of the other gospels nearly every Palm Sunday. The crowds that, that have surrounded Jerusalem have gathered to announce his arrival. They're shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. They're using this kingly title. They're essentially announcing to everyone who will listen, look, pay attention, the king is here. Again, if you were on that road that day, if you were outside of Jerusalem when all of this was happening, if you had spent your entire life in the anticipation of the moment when would God would come to reestablish his kingdom in your heart, in your mind, you're thinking, 
it's finally happening. Everything that I've waited for, everything that our people have prayed for for generations is finally happening. Think for a moment back to that first interaction that we looked at. When the Pharisees, who had been paying attention to what Jesus was saying, and and honestly, who had felt a little bit left out of it because they were the power brokers of the day and the elite and felt like they should be the actioners of this movement, they come to Jesus and they say, where's, where's this kingdom that you've been talking about? You've been proclaiming it. You say it's near. If we're being honest, we don't see it. You remember Jesus' reply to them? He says, it's in your midst. It's all around you. You, you just aren't seeing it. You see, we, as followers of Jesus, as the church, we can't understand the nature of the kingdom without first understanding the nature of the king. Jesus has come to establish a spiritual kingdom, right? It's it's experienced. People see it through physical things. If you read through the end of Matthew chapter 4, if you read throughout uh, Matthew 8 and 9, you see all sorts of people who have a physical healing as a result of, of Jesus' ministry. People experience in the kingdom, but the nature of the victory that Jesus came to win was a spiritual victory. The the throne that Jesus sought to take wasn't in Jerusalem, and it's not in Rome. It's in us. It's in each and every one of us. The crowds that surrounded Jerusalem on that day understood that, that Jesus was a king. They're announcing it. They're proclaiming it. What they failed to understand was the sort of king he was and therefore the nature of his kingdom. And in that, when that happens, shouts of Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David ultimately turn to shouts of crucify him. See, Jesus' victory would not come through military might. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be the result of some political power play. Jesus' ultimate victory, the ushering in of the kingdom, would come through a cross and ultimately through an empty grave. And perhaps for you and I, one of the greatest surprises that we experience in his kingdom is that ultimate freedom, the truest sense of freedom that you and I will ever know in our lives, is experienced when we're fully surrendered to the king. You know, all around us and in the world right now, and we see moments when there's fear and anxiety and, and people are concerned. We've seen panic buying and all kinds of, of craziness. But we have also seen people loving their neighbors. We talk about at Chapel Street all the time that the vision is to be a chapel on our streets. And we're seeing this happen. Perhaps in such a time as this, there is a unique opportunity for the church to represent and to build the kingdom in a unique way that was not present or was not as readily available to us as it is now. And so my heart and my prayer for us is that we would be a people living according to his kingdom, living a kingdom-oriented life so that the world may know our king. Would you pray with us? Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for this opportunity to gather and we in our hearts acknowledge and proclaim you as king. So God, remind us and reorient us away from how our world operates and what we're accustomed to and what we're used to living in and reorient our hearts and minds around your kingdom where the last shall be first and the first shall be last, where where the weak are made strong and the strong are made weak. Lord, reorient us to you. That as we seek to live in your kingdom, we may proclaim to the world our king. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.